I'll call the order to the February Finance Committee meeting. Folks, we have several very important items on the general agenda, which we'll get to second, secondarily. But we'll start. Are there any items on the consent agenda that anyone would like pulled? C2. C2. Any others from anyone at the table? Move approval of balance. We have a motion to approve the balance. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed likewise. That passes. We'll now start with agenda uh, consent agenda number two. Minority and Women Business Enterprise Program Annual Report. Ms. Adams, you requested this? Um, I was uh, at a meeting yesterday in Charlotte, mm -hmm. and they were talking about their minority women's and business uh, uh, plan, how they implemented and facilitated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed when we got our package that this was in here, but uh, I personally would like, uh, I think the council needs to have a full report on this. I noticed this information, but as important as this is, uh, I think this is something that we all need to be looking at. Okay, so you'd like a brief presentation? Yes, I would, sir. Okay. Okay. Go right ahead. Well, you have been provided our MWBE annual report for 2012-2013. Um, during the fiscal year, MWBEs in all city business were able to capture 10 10.29% of overall spending. That's up from the 8.8% from last fiscal year. As you know, subcontracting is the one that we follow in goals. In the subcontracting category, the MWBEs captured 17.84% of all construction on those projects. Last year's goal was 14.3%, so that is a good increase, and it, as you know, is above our 10% minimum. Excuse me. For the MWB annual report, we follow it in four different categories. As you can tell in the report, subcontracting being one, also materials and services, construction and repair, as well as procurement card spending, P card spending. In all three categories, we did have some great increases in materials and services. Our NWBE spending increased of 1.9 million dollars to 2.25 million dollars that was that accounted for 3.73 percent up from 3.1 percent from last year in construction and repair mwbes were able to capture 15.17 well from 18.8 percent which is up from 15.76 percent from last year and in the last category procurement card spending mwbe spending was up to, was 3.79% up from 3.7% from last year. Um, lastly, um, you can also in, see in here the staff activities for the year. Some activities are as our business training program, 10-week program. We also have our website, which provides information 24 hours a day. We have our directory, which we have up to 230 plus MWBEs that are certified in the directory. We also send weekly emails, calendars, of events and opportunities. We also have our MWBE Let's Do Business show and our other activities from the year. As far as MWBE spending goes for the city alone, because our report includes the city as well as the Utilities Commission, <coughs> excuse me, for city projects we had 23.7% uh, participation for MWBE, so that's considerable, considerably high, way past our 10% minimum. Of that, that is 13.2% minority business and 10.6% women business. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, I'm concerned because, you know, I know we're supposed, we can't, as they say, mandate anything. But we're going to have to do better than what we have right here because uh, apparently more women, the women businesses are okay. They're getting a lot of business. And we see a lot of the contracts come across this desk that we vote on, and that's great. But minorities aren't faring very well at all. And I think we need to be focusing on that because if this is supposed to be a linchpin for us to make, uh, to get our small businesses going, particularly our minorities, then we gotta do better than this. And even if the goal is 10%, there might need to be an inside goal because 
for me personally and some of the complaints I'm getting from the, the constituency, they're not happy with this. And, and we can do more. We can do much more than this. And I see all of the staff activity, and that's great. But I'm one of these people that I need to, we need to be about it. We need to see some action. This here, to me, is OK for marketing and public service. But we need to actually be doing something that we can put our hands on that actually says this year we helped five businesses and next year we help six businesses. And whether that's where we get with our small business department, economic development, I don't know where this, but this to me, and I don't know about my other council members, is un unacceptable. Well, historically, we do have more participation on the women's side. There are considerably more women-owned businesses and minority businesses. We're always working to help them develop those businesses, get certified, and get tied into our projects. Um, a plus there is that compared to last year, we only had 5.7% minority participation on city projects alone, which up to 13.2% minority participation on the city projects this year. So there's definitely always areas for um, growth and development, and we are working with them. And we're always considering new ways to help build our businesses, minority businesses in particular. Mr. Montgomery had a question. A couple questions. Um, do we know the exact number of um, businesses that we helped to become HUB certified this year? I have worked with a number. I believe last during the fiscal year, about a dozen were able to become certified that weren't previously certified. I can always check to make sure the exact numbers and get it back to you. And but it is a lengthy process. Some started last year and didn't get through until this fiscal year actually began. And you have to be certified in order for us to count your participation, correct? You have to be certified on the formal construction projects. That's the 300000 and up uh, to be considered towards those participation goals. However, in the total spending for city projects, we include those that we know are minority but may not currently be certified. And again, as I look at the particularly looking at subcontracting activities over the last 10 years, this past year was the second highest um, in terms of participation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going in the right direction, doing some things. But I do agree with Councilman Adams that there are some additional things that we can do. Received an email um, today, today or yesterday, um, on the same thing in terms of minority women business owned businesses and participation. And um, I believe. Uh, Mr. Garrity and Mr. Page received the same email that I received in reference to uh, minority participation um, in certain things. And just looking at some of those numbers that were presented on real projects that took place in this city, those numbers are drastically higher than mm -hmm. some of the things that we do here in the city. And so it would be interesting to me. I know some of the things we do that you may not have a minority owned or women business that does a certain type of, of operation, so you won't be able to have them to do that. But looking at some projects that have taken place in this city and have had extremely higher participation, it's a question of what are they doing, what are they capturing that we're not capturing in that process. And so I'm going to ask the city manager, and I know there's already some conversations supposed to be scheduled uh, to, to talk about that, but just to really dive in and look at what are they doing or what did they do so different than what we're currently doing, even with some of the adjustments that we've made. Sure. Ms. Burke had a question. Thank you. Since I did introduce this bill some years ago, and I guess the mayor and I can talk about some of the struggles we've gone through, but we still have some struggles. I'm very pleased to bring that up, and I hope your comments. Uh, the city manager heard us real clear when we talked about minority businesses, and that's why we have an individual. But the question comes to my mind, and I've said this before, when we, when we do get new we have what we do, the way we do it, what's different that they bring to the table to help us to improve the program. And I think what you need to do, Mr. City Manager, is to look at the comments that was made, but also uh, like these 35 people I read about, how do we track them? I'm not going to try to tell you how to do your program, but there ought to be some type of more of a concrete plan that we track them, we see what they're doing, and when an individual is hired, it is to move us to another level. And I would hope that, uh, Mr. City Manager, please look at me. Mm -hmm. I hope he has the uh, lead way to make changes because some of our new employees come in and they want to make some changes. 
but we don't know what keeps them from moving to that next level. In all fairness to Mr. Ferby, I would like, we know some of the handicaps we've been having with the department that he's in, and I would like uh, to see from him to give a report to us, what did he actually bring to improve this program? Thank you. Ms. Light had a question or comment. Um, <clears throat> explain to me, if you will, the difference between certified, I gather that's with the state, yes. and licensed. <clears throat> Lic because I'm, I'm skittish about the whole license thing now after the uh, Auburn mm -hmm. Station business. So explain that. Does someone have to be licensed to be certified? Well, um, with the construction projects, I know there are some rules towards um, businesses holding a local privilege license. I assume that's what you're referring to. Um, as far as the certification, it's a statewide certification. We used to do it here locally, but now we utilize the hub so they get certified once for the whole state and can use it wherever they go. Um, in that certification, there's a number of things they have to provide, documents they have to provide. One could be a privilege license. Um, other things to show that they are actually in business, information on their articles of incorporation. Um, we do help them to get certified. It normally takes 30 to 45 days. It is a considerable am amount of documentation, but the state wants to make sure that the business, businesses are legitimate and the owners are actually minority and, or women and they actually are operating the businesses and not just putting their name to it. Yeah. Well, and I, I think I'm still missing a link here because I could pay a privilege license for a privilege license saying I'm a <coughs> contractor when I don't know squat about the building or whatever. So uh, take me to that step. Let me let me take a stab at it. We, we require if we if, if we're contracting directly with uh, with with a vendor to do work, we're going to require them to show not only that they paid their business privilege license, but that they're a licensed contractor that they have a contractor's license with the state and with the, the trade industry that they're involved in, as well as liability insurance, all those things we require of all contractors, whether they're HUD cer HUB certified or not. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Because I, I do believe one of the problems at Auburn Station is some of the contractors were not licensed right. in their respective field. And by law, they don't need to be if it's under so many dollars. Is, what, is that right, Mr. Page? Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. But also, in looking at the permits we give, if you say you are a licensed, certified uh, heating and cooling person, mm -hmm. the inspection office will not pass a building if they don't see their license. And what they do, the only thing you have to do now is just get on the internet, and it can tell you if these people are. I, I regret that Auburn Station was like it was, but as the folks say, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to move beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bessie had a question. Just in terms of clarification, the only thing that the HUB certification is certifying is that it is a minority or mm -hmm. women-owned business. It, it's not looking at whether they're qualified or licensed in particular fields. But Just to make sure they are owned and operated. It doesn't speak to their capacity. That, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Last comment. Thank you, you Chair. all you want. Um, when I was in Charlotte yesterday, I was with a group of their leaders, city leaders, and the conversation, one of the conversations came up about the minority women's business uh, program. And they were letting us know, the people from Charlotte, your hometown, Mr. Mayor said, watch out, don't bring, don't talk to me about Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> they said that they had contracted someone to do a diversity study of their program or to ensure that it, the numbers, I'm not saying anybody's missed, but they had to be sure because they were getting, getting ready to get lawsuits and everything else because it was not done the way that they all thought it was being done. And they did, uh, you know, uh, give the money. The council voted for like, I think, two or $300,000 for this study to be done by this group. And they found out that there was a lot of things that they needed to uh, improve, like right now. And uh, they were saying that they were glad that they did that, not taking anything away from their staff. But they just needed to make sure that they were compliant with 
all of the levels that they needed to be to ensure that because they have a lot of government contracts and things that they do down there, not just local, but state, federal, and they had to have that done. And they were very, you know, happy with the outcome of that because at that point they moved on and did some improvements that enhanced their program. And I'm wondering if we need to do that. I just want us to be right. As Ms. Bird said, I want us to be right. That's all. So that's later. It, it, it just echo Councilman Adams uh, statement there and in, in Councilmember Taylor's absence, I will say that has been one thing particular when we made the changes to the goals uh, that was stated at the same time by Councilmember Taylor as a uh, urging of council to consider um, having a diversity study done and I support it then and that's something I still support. May, may I, say mm -hmm. I think it's good when we talk about having these studies made but when you're talking about the amount of the money that we're talking about, city manager, I would have asked you to please carefully look at what our program is all about, what kind of improvements we as a staff can see what we can do, and then also take a peep at our Charlotte to see what they're talking about. And if we do something like that, we may not have to spend the type of investment that, because that's a lot of money, but it's kind of like this, but I think it's a good point can to bring up. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Mr. Mayor. And you have to be a little bit careful too, because I think in Charlotte they were trying to back up their their program, and sometimes the diversity studies won't back it up, and then your your program gets diminished, and you have to go the other way with it. It can't be as strong as you really want it to be. So you have to be have to be a little bit careful about about those things. What do you mean by back up? In other words, that you can have if you have a certain level of diversity. Uh, Problems. And yeah. if, if a study validates that, then I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you can um, maybe have a stronger program, uh, more, maybe, maybe a little bit more than a goals program. Mm -hmm. But without that, you, you, you can't. And if you find that your community is really not that bad of shape diversity-wise in terms of the hard numbers, then you may have to back away, back your program down a little bit as well. So oh, okay. you have to be a little bit nervous, but careful about it. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? This is just for information only. We thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think that was the only item that we pulled off the consent. If you'll yes. now go to the, um, and let me just preface by saying we have two very important items on the main agenda. One has to do with the fund balances. This is some information that we do get periodically. We have not gotten it in several years. And the other one has to do with a new proposed program which is basically a RUCA program for residential, and I know that's being presented to some other committees as well, including, I think, general government at 6 o'clock tonight, I believe. So with that, Ben, I'll look to you or whoever is going to, or Lisa, who is going to do our G1, if you'll introduce G1 for us. Consideration of items related to the financial policies and a fund balances report for the city of Winston-Salem. A, resolution adopting financial policies and recommendations regarding city funds for the City of Winston-Salem, and B, ordinance amending the annual appropriation and tax levy ordinance for the City of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for the fiscal year 2013-2014. Lisa, Alrighty. you got the floor. Okay, good afternoon, Chairman Clark, Mayor, and members of City Council. Good ben afternoon. Rowell, Assistant City Manager, and myself will be presenting this report. Um, we're requesting your consideration of items related to financial policies and the fund balance report for the City. We're asking you to um, approve a resolution adopting financial policies and recommendations regarding city funds, as well as a presentation of a fund balance report. And B, also there is a budget ordinance amendment attached, if you choose to approve that as well. Um, the Financial Management Services Department has been updating the city's financial policies to include more formal guidelines for maintaining target fund balances for general fund, debt service fund, enterprise fund and internal service funds. Those policies are attached as Exhibit A. In addition, the fund balance uh, report is attached as Exhibit B. The financial policies document is really just a compilation of long-term financial policies that the city has practiced for many years. Um, the document includes policies regarding the operating budget, the capital investments, debt, cash management, accounting, auditing, financial reporting, reserves, and fund balances. City Council or under City Council's guidance, these policies and long-time practices have enabled us to have a AAA um, credit rating from all three um, rating agencies since 1999. There are a few key guidelines that are established in the financial policies. 
one of which, and which is really the only change in the policy, the City Council has followed a policy of maintaining an unreserved um, fund balance of 10 percent, excuse me, of the expenditure, bu of the expenditure budget. We are um, recommending that you change that to 12 and a half percent. Um, it's a, still a very conservative policy. Um, historically, the general fund balances have been well within that over the years. Um, the requirement should be attainable, and it should strengthen the city's financial position. Also, it's seen as a very positive move for credit rating agencies. Um, they all three are developing new guidelines um, in this economic times, and um, more stringent guidelines is that, and this is that's seen as a very positive move. Um, secondly, um, reserve and fund balance policies for debt service funds, enterprise funds, internal service funds, the, the new uh, or the policy, um, the financial policies, they're basically the current practices that we follow today. We're just putting them in writing. Um, the third guideline, the Citizens Operation Efficiency Review recommended that City Council adopt a policy regarding acceptance of one-time grant money. That is included in the financial policies. Um, um, exhibit B, as I said, is the fund balance report, and Ben's going to go over that in a moment in more detail. In that fund balance re report, um, staff was asked to look to, at ways to consolidate some of our funds and um, look for better ways to do things. And there's four recommendations that we have. One is to account for property taxes allocated to the mass transit tax fund, which is currently in a special revenue fund. We're recommending um, deleting that fund and just putting them all in the mass transit tax enterprise fund. Secondly, we're looking at moving the sales tax, which is uh, part of uh, Articles 40 and 42 acts there now in the um, special sales tax fund, and we're looking at moving them directly into the general fund and debt service funds as appropriate. Third, we're looking at eliminating the cable, cable franchise fee fund, which is basically a fund that just has a remaining fund balance that needs to be spent out. And fourth, we're going to be recommending to transfer $4 million from general fund to the health benefits fund and the workers' comp fund to meet the targeted fund balance reserves that we recommended in the document um, for catastrophic claims <coughs> loss. Um, and, and to mention also the other targeted fund balances that have been our current practice are met as they are. These are the only two that have not been met. And if you choose to do that, there's a budget amendment included in this package to do that. Um, and the other act recommendations that we have actually would be incorporated in the 2014-15 budget if you choose to recommend those. And so with that, I will turn it over to Ben, and he's going to go over more specifically the okay, balance uh, report. Ms. Light has a quick question. Yeah, Lisa, <coughs> explain to me the part about ex uh, accepting um, one-time grant, that policy. The actually, way I read it, it's, it says we will accept that and then think about whether we'll, uh, you know, extend that, uh, those positions. What about those, and I think we've had some that say um, we'll give you the grant for five years and you have to fund it for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Is that addressed here at all? I don't think so. I think I think I think the I think more the point was is to address the fact that if it's a one time grant it, it should come before council with council's you know, knowledge and acceptance that it is a one time grant and when the grant is over with. Um, Councilmember Light, a yeah. good example would be the stimulus grant we received that funded the police officer positions mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who were required under the guidelines of that grant to carry those positions <coughs> one year beyond the three year grant period. Yeah. Obviously, we would have to do that, but then the decision comes what happens in After five. That. Mm -hmm. and what this policy says is that would be reviewed and discussed by City Council as to whether those positions continue to be funded. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dan, you had a question? Yeah. I uh, actually had a, had a couple, Go if ahead. I may, it seems like the, the time. Just to follow up on that uh, first, um, would you include any kind of action level for that recommendation that is if if a grant is less than you know twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars whatever it doesn't have to come through for council approval um or is 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 the concept that no matter how small 
you'd have to get council approval for a uh, matching grant. You know, essentially, they're coming regardless of the size. Yeah. They are coming through for your approval. If there's, if it, right now, what we've been right. done is if, if, if it requires a match, either directly or at the end, no matter how small it is, we bring it here first. So this isn't going to increase the number of mm -hmm. items no. that we have. Um, then the other questions I had have to do with the um, uh, the, the minimum um, general fund unassigned fund balance recommendation <laughs> from 10 to 12 and a half. Um, two questions really. Um, one, uh, do you have trend information over time indicating that that we have historically <laughs> not been dropping below the 12 and a half? And and two, can you tell us what impact it would have? on the current, you know, about 18 percent general unassigned general fund balance if, if we take the recommendation of transferring $4 million from the general fund balance. Okay. Um, first of all, historically, I'd say for the last 10 years, there have been two times that we have dropped below the 12 and a half, and they've only been slightly below 12 percent. So I think it's very attainable. Um, you know, the policy has been 10 percent for years. Um, state statutes, 8 percent. Um, I think it just, it's a, it's a target, and I think it is attainable. Um, this last year was 18%, and 2012 was 16, 2011 was 17. So it's for the last several years, very much so. And then the, the $4 million transfer, what would the effect that have on, on We actually have a chart to show that, um, so I think Ben will go over that when we get to the, to the chart. You can see it a little bit clearer. Ms. Burke? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like for her to go more in detail with three, eliminate the CAPA funds, franchise fee. Those are funds that are, if, if you remember, there was PEG money that we actually received years ago, and it's actually been sitting there for quite some time. So once those funds are spent, um, and they can only be used for um, okay. PEG money, it's, yeah, it can only be used for that. So once they're spent, we can actually eliminate that fund. And marketing communication has a plan for that. Yeah. The reason I wanted that to be brought to the attention because when we bring up the cable, a lot of the individuals in the city who can, but that one, that cable company who controls everything, mm -hmm. those fees <laughs> that they charge, I, I thought it would be interesting for us to make some comments about it because we're not really giving the cable company, Correct. but the cable company that we are in, have the franchise with, the one we have a franchise with. Uh, Mr. City Manager, how do we have to con They have us in a bind. The, the state changed the law several years ago, and the, we no longer have the franchise. The state has the franchise. Uh, we have zero control over the rates or the regulations of the, of the cable companies. We do get a cable franchise fee as part of the utility franchise, uh, but we have no control over, over the cable company. So now when our constituents talk to us about it, we've heard it from you. I will say, if Ben is going to go over a minute, you'll see all these numbers. Yeah. This, this actual fund has very little money left, and there's no, no new money going into it. So we'll go over that specifically. I'm not sure. I just want to take it. Yeah. OK. Ben, if you'll yeah. come up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to be primarily focused on uh, pages I think it's page 55. I'm going to start on page 55 and, and just want to briefly go over this first table. Uh, this first table shows where our funds stood at the end of fiscal year 2012-2013 in terms of their fund balances. We have uh, show a number of designations of those balances and I just want to briefly uh, describe those. Reserved by law basically means balances that we're required to, to set aside either by some external uh, party. A good example would be a state statute requires us to set aside general fund balance to cover any outstanding encumbrances at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, reserved by policy would be more uh, reserves that have been set aside based on council policy. So for example, in water and sewer, when uh, the city entered into an agreement with the county to create the City County Utility Commission, water and sewer revenues would, were to only be used for water and sewer purposes. So this has been reserved by policy. Uh, now within that area, if there's a fund balance, uh, I would submit that, that you could use those funds for water and sewer projects or purposes, but it's still re restricted for that purpose. Uh, 
Uh, and that's also set aside uh, to help maintain the financial sustainability uh, of the fund. Then committed by appropriation would simply be those, those, those uh, funds that have actually been appropriated as part of the budget, whether it's the current fiscal year budget or even prior year budgets in the case of some of our, our multi-year capital project funds. And then the green column there is undesignated. And undesignated truly is just that, that those, those funds would be available for any purpose that the council uh, chose to, to, to uh, appropriate those funds for. So that's, that's the uh, kind of the, the summary there at the end of the fiscal year. If you turn to page 58, what we did was do a second version of this table to reflect the uh, financial policies that Lisa reviewed, as well as the recommendations that we're, we're proposing for uh, some of our funds in terms of our fund balances. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to just really hit on those, those funds, kind of point out those changes. So to start with, with the general fund, in the previous uh, page, we were showing an undesignated, undesignated fund balance of about $14.4 million. Um, with the increase in the reserve from 10% to 12.5%, that reduces that undesignated, undesignated amount by about $4.4 million. And then the recommendation to move $4 million into our workers' comp and health benefits funds takes it down an additional $4 million. So $8.4 million in total that we would be uh, either redesignating as reserved by policy or transferring to two other funds to help meet our financial policies for those funds. So you go from 14.4 million to, to just under 6 million. The general fund also includes, in, if you look at the um, actual fund balance <coughs> numbers there in the reserve by law, also includes what was the balance in the special <coughs> sales tax fund. So that sales tax fund is eliminated uh, and that fund balance is now reflected in, in the general fund because that's where most of those revenues will go. So you'll see on that list that there is no special sales tax fund listed. Also, there's no mass transit tax fund uh, balance shown on this table as well. That is now uh, reflected in the Winston-Salem Transit Authority Fund, which is about two-thirds of the way down the page. So it's now showing a fund balance of $1.1 million. Uh, and at this point in time, it was, most of that is reserved by law because at the end of fiscal year 2012-13, we had not received most of our federal money, and so basically uh, that was, it was, it was basically a, uh, had to be reserved. There was a, basically a, a due to a liability out there. Um, I think we've, we've received most of that money now, and so, so really and truly we would count on that to help us with covering operations and, and providing matches for, uh, for capital grants. Ben, can you comment on the second chart on page 58, the last column that you did add, the long-term debt? Yes, sir. Uh, so we did add to that second table the long-term debt outstanding uh, to just show the outstanding obligations that we do have uh, for the funds that are above that, that subtotal line. That, those are our outstanding debt amounts. So in the case of, uh, let's say, water and sewer, you're looking at $489 million in outstanding revenue bond debt. Um, those last several uh, funds listed, the Post-Employment Benefits Fund, the Winston-Salem Police Officer Retirement System Fund, those reflect more our obligations, not, not necessarily debt per se, but our obligations with, with those, those fiduciary funds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I could offer a few comments and I'll open it up. And by the way, Ben and I have met several times when we tried to get it together. Uh, first off, and I'm gonna talk mostly on page 58, uh, the reason I asked him to put the long-term debt in there, if you look at this thing at a first pass, that we have close to a little bit over $500 million worth of cash or marketable securities, which sounds like an awful lot of money. But if you look in the far right column, we have about a billion dollars worth of obligations. So it's not like we have money just sitting around with nothing to do. Now, I will say of that billion dollars, roughly half of it is water and sewer and solid waste, and that is the Utilities Commission. The, excuse me, they do issue a great deal of revenue bonds. It's a very capital-intensive business, especially since I've been on this council. So we've rebuilt the Thomas Water Treatment Plant was, I think, roughly $50 million, and the new uh, Pat Swan uh, Water Treatment Plant was another $50 million, and we've done some other things. So a lot of money is spent there. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, on the bottom part, as you mentioned, uh, we, as you know, we do uh, 
handle the retirement for police officers, and we, while we do have a, a great deal of, of assets in the bank to cover them, there's still not enough to cover what our current liabilities are, so we work a lot there. One last uh, question I'll ask you, Ben. Uh, the health benefit fund, if folks, if you look on page 58 at the subtotal, go up about four lines, it says health benefit fund. Uh, we currently have, and this is one of the two funds you're requesting us to put money into. Um, this one is near and dear to me because I believe at one time, and Lee, you can refresh my memory, but that fund had $7 million in it, something like that? Yes. Um, there's a number of reasons you have fund balances, and you know you can equate this to your savings account or whatever you want to call it, your 401k account or whatever. It's where you save up money for just unknown things. And, and what we have done, and this is a good example in the health benefit area, during this recession we have paid for a lot of our health care costs by pulling our savings down in that category to so say it's gone from seven million and I believe now it's basically zero or in the red as we spend today. And now this is as of June thirtieth of last year. So uh, that's one reason or that is the reason we're asking to, to have some more, more money put in there and the same thing with the workman's comp. Uh, each year we project what we think it's gonna cost to insure our workers' health insurance. Now we we self-insure, so whatever it is, it is. But we have to guesstimate on that, and we use that estimate to charge the departments and, so, and also to set the rates that the employees pay. But uh, even though we do have a large number of employees, a, a couple of unusually large claims can, can mess it up. So you do need some rainy day fund or whatever you want to call it there to, to kind of balance that. So uh, I certainly think that's a good idea. Uh, if we had not had that money in seven years ago, we, we would have had to come up with $7 million during a very difficult recession to balance the budget because we did, in fact, spend that. Um, and I guess the last comment, I, or second last comment I make, Didi, oftentimes you, you say, well, the city manager, if we need some money, he tends to find it. And this is where he finds it. I want everybody to understand this. There's no hidden pot of gold out there. Basically, Mr. Garrity comes in here and depends on what it is, he tries to find some fund. Now, some of these are restricted by federal law, state law, whatever, uh, depending on the source of the revenue. But he tries to find some fund that this seems to, to fit into that he can pull money from. Uh, I point that out in that if you were to go back 10 or 15 years ago, these funds had a lot more money in them than they do now. We have certainly depleted these considerably, uh, particularly in the last five years, is we have, have tried not to have to raise taxes or cut benefits or salaries or whatever to, to kind of do everything we needed to do. So anyway, those are just some quick comments from my perspective. Any other, any questions or comments from anybody? Ms. Adams. Um, just as uh, Council Member Clark was saying, we've met with uh, <coughs> financial staff about the fund balances and everything to get a better understanding. Um, we have also met recently with the uh, HR department of uh, the uh, submitting of proposals for our health care. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, got an email yesterday that they submitted that as well. Um, one of the things we want to keep in mind, and we hope that each and every council member will, go through and read the definitions of what these funds are and what they do. Uh, I would also like, and uh, Ben, thank you, and Lisa and the staff for what you've done. I would like a spreadsheet with just only the undesignated as to, as projects and things come to us, uh, as we keep trying to keep our economic wheels going, uh, as council members, we will need to do that because if people in our wards or in the city come to us with a plan, an idea, maybe they have a little money, we would like to be able to refer to it on, you know, for our own uh, knowledge as to what we might have available when we do meet with the city manager about an idea that we may have or the uh, economic development department. Uh, I'd like to see that. I have a litany of questions, but I'm not going to do them here. I'm going to get with uh, Lisa and Ben about them. Uh, I highlighted everything that I wanted to, that I had questions about. So mine will be forthcoming. It is my intent to hold this in committee this right. month because this, there's a lot of stuff in here. That you need to read. Uh, and then we will deal with the proposals at the next meeting. Mr. Bassett. Yeah, I, I did have one issue that I wanted to raise, um, an item in the revenue policy. 
uh, do you have a page you'd like us to refer page to? Page 12. 12. Uh, under revenue policy, it's uh, sub item C. Hang on. Dan, give everybody. Sure. Page 12, item C. Under user fees? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, right currently, it currently reads, um, uh, user fees will be established to cover the cost of services that can be individually identified and where costs are directly related to the provision of or to the level of service provided. Um, I'd suggest for consideration the possibility that, that may be more sweeping than we intend. Certainly, it, that would be, if it read, user fees may be established to cover the cost of services, et cetera. That may be more in keeping with, with our current practice and intent. Um, because there are cases where we could quantify uh, cost of service and shift uh, the financing of a service from general fund uh, or rather from sort of general taxation uh, like um, uh, property and sales to a user fee. But there would be cases in which to do so would have a regressive impact. For example, to, to change our practice um, of including the cost of sanitation pickup, the basics, that is that every household has to have garbage uh, or, you know, recycling that every, everybody has and uh, to shift that from sort of the general tax base to a per household user fee would have a regressive impact. That is, it would charge a, uh, a modest income household a higher percentage of their income. So I would suggest we consider shifting that from will to may, or including some language about, you know, you know that, that they will be done, and where implementation of user fee will not uh, produce a regressive impact of increasing <coughs> the relative financial burden of income, mm -hmm. modest income count household, something like that. Okay, uh, it's been noted. Uh, James, we're on G, uh, G1. Okay. Mr. Montgomery's been waiting patiently. Couple questions. Um, as we look at the the long term debt that's there. And seeing that the that, that highest amount there is in the water and sewer and looking at our city county utilities, with the breakdown of, uh, of that in terms of being city county utilities, what I, I see our share of that. Is this the same number of, appears on the county balance sheet? What is there? How does, how does that work? How does that actually break down? It, it's all on our balance sheet. It's we all on we, we own. Uh, the utility system, the land, and, and, the re and all of the bond obligations. So none of it is on the county's balance sheet. We should appoint all the members to the City and County <laughs> Utility Commission then. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> You're out of order on that. <laughs> um, yeah. that. For example, all the employees of the Utility mm -hmm. Commission are city employees. Right. right. Should be, go ahead. All right. And I'll save that for some more conversation later. Um, with actually, with the fund balances that we have in, that we have here, what what type of restrictions are there in terms of? Well, the better question is, what do we get back from these dollars sitting in the accounts? Do we receive any interest income on these? Uh, and where is that allocated? And how is that allocated? The way the investments work is all the city cash is pulled. So it's all pulled and investment income is allocated to each particular fund with the exception of all of the general governmental funds, it gets allocated to debt service fund. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, okay. it does. Mr. Chairman. Let me just get one second. Let me just point out too under the, um, the assets and I happen to sit on the, uh, if you look at the whispers, which is the third item from bottom, the whispers, a lot, 60% uh, of that I think is stock and 40% is cash or bonds, something like that. Probably even more, more 820. 820, whatever. But most of this is hard cash, but some is stocks and bonds. Ms. Yeah. Burke? Um, I was going to say maybe Ms. Saunders, this is about where we, how we invest our money and who's investing our money. Did you go with us to, to see those folks uh, in New York? Yeah, a long time ago. long yeah. time. And uh, our money, we'd never actually seen the overall picture of the money and who's investing it and where they invest in that money. And I felt that it was important for us to see that and to hear that. And I think for the new council people, it may help you to understand because we talk about spending money, but we, we make, need to make sure we keep a triple bond rating, how that money is being invested and who's investing that money for us. Actually, if y'all could first follow up, get us some information on where, where that $501 million is. 
Okay. Other questions or comments? Again, I'm going to keep this in committee. That this is a lot of stuff to digest. And for the new folks, I have seen this for, uh, probably eight or nine years ago. It is quite complicated. Uh, some of these funds are separated because we got some federal grant years ago for a specific person, purpose, and we segregate those funds. Others are a way of us simply to capture, uh, and you mentioned the gasoline tax, for example. We capture that as it comes in from Raleigh and then transfer it either to the the well, general fund part of it's or used the, for street resurfacing, and then most of it's used to cover um, operations costs in our tra Department of Transportation. And, it, has and, to, it has to be for maintenance of municipal streets. If I could give a very recent example, we recently passed a resolution that we would capture part of the sweepstakes money to go towards Rucas. Well, we'll if, if we're going to do that, we'll have to capture that in a fund so that we'll know how much it is. And the, and, while it's just a bookkeeping entry, it is a way of knowing, you know, well, how much did we get in? Well, when the money comes in from the franchise folks, they'll put 20% here and 80% there, whatever. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the money, the dollars themselves are commingled into a single account. But that's how we can answer questions like uh, uh, the parking deck, for example, parking fund. When we, get, when we sold the decks, that money goes into a fund that pays the debt on the debts, on the decks we still have. So. Uh, there's a story behind every one of these, I guess is what I'm getting at, and, and it's a lot to learn. Any other questions or comments for this? Again, we're going to think about this. Yes, ma'am. Uh, since you mentioned the sweet stakes, yeah, we won't have to worry about that anymore. That's going away, too. They were telling us uh, the legal Why municipalities. You who you're referring to? When the you legal municipalities, as Attorney Carmen and some others know, they had a conference call this afternoon about the uh, license privilege, license fee. And uh, I'm sure you saw the email from Attorney Carmen where we're going to lose $2.1 million or more. Uh, they named, some of us wanted to know, like, because this bill, when it comes, it's not just going to have, as we know, as Councilmember Bessie knows, there's a litany of things involved in this tax or revenue loss bill that's coming through the State House. The main one is this one, this privilege, because they're standing to gain about 27 it's 27 million billion something, but it's a lot of money coming from the cities, and those cities that are the large cities in North Carolina will be hurt most. It's about 12 of us. Uh, the smaller cities will be hurt even more because they don't have the revenues and the, the businesses that we have. If a person owns a ma and pa business, as they said, and I own maybe the largest target in town, our privileged license fee now becomes the same thing. So we're going to lose that money. Uh, the other thing they brought up was the sweepstakes. That for all intended purposes, as Attorney Carmen has been telling us, that's gone. That that's going to be part of this deal coming through as well. Uh, they were also talking about the hold harmless. Mm -hmm. Is that it? That too is going to be affected. And what all of us were asking basically was, as we prepare our budgets this year, our financial people will be looking at those things because as we move through next year, they won't be there anymore. So we need to be aware as council, what is it that we're going to have to be looking at even harder because it won't be there. They were talking about the tax increases to citizens across the state. And they just want us to go ahead and be prepared because next year, that money, a lot of this money will no longer be there. So as we struggled the past five years, to try to keep taxes as low as we could, we are now going to get, have to get real smart because it's just going to be hard. But the same message we all agreed on the phone today will be preached from all of the uh, municipalities to our citizens at a level that they can understand how all of this is going to impact everybody's quality of life going forward. So, okay. no and, and what uh, Ms. Abbs referred to, the North Carolina League of Munis Municipalities had a uh, conference call that you could listen in today and make comments and they talked about things that I would say pending legislation in Raleigh has none of it's been passed yet but it's pending and uh, and that's why it's important when we do go down to what we call town hall day every year we all go to Raleigh it's important for all of us to go and to uh, express our opinion and I believe on April the first or so we're meeting with our state delegation something like April 1st and that that, that uh, that morning we can talk to them about these as well as some other things okay folks we're going to keep that in committee a month this month if that's okay with everybody and feel free to call ben or lisa if you have any questions on it okay
Okay, G2, please. Let me, folks, let me just comment. We have 40 minutes left, and I think we're okay. So, G2, please. Report on the revitalizing urban residential areas program. Mr. Page, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just a second. Turn it off for just a second and give you a little background. First of all, thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. This item is not for any consideration. It's really for discussion purposes and for you to provide direction to staff as we go forward, assuming this is a concept, and it is in its early conceptual stages of trying to design a program to address some needs that we see out there that you all have sort of pointed to us as being critical issues for you. So uh, we're bringing this program for you in a design uh, phase. And uh, based on your direction, what we may like to do is go forward with this, have community meetings, get additional input as we go forward before we bring something back to you for final consideration at some point out in the future. But the concept that we are presenting this afternoon, and if you can think of a better name, we'd be more than happy to uh, yeah. consider that as well. But right now, we're just calling it RUVA. Uh, <laughs> we'll revitalizing, <laughs> yeah. revitalizing urban residential areas. And it's sort of the same acronym with RUCA, Revitalizing Urban Commercial Areas, which back in uh, 2002, 2003, we actually established the RUCA program, and that program was looking at blighted commercial areas in town, recognizing that uh, that program, to the most part, has been fairly successful. What we've started looking at now is residential areas and using some of that same concept of trying to leverage private investment in order to help revitalize the areas that need it most in town. So uh, we've started designing this program. So I'm going to go through you to, uh, with today through you. And no, you can't see this map. I have it both in high tech and low tech. And it really doesn't work either way. But really just focus on the big blue blobs. That's really the most important thing that you need to be focusing on. Those blue blobs identify all around Winston-Salem the unfit housing violations from a five-year period, fiscal year 2008 through fiscal year 2013. So looking at a five-year period and the unfit housing violations that have been cited through um, community and business development over that five-year period. You'll see that the majority of those uh, unfit housing violations are in the north, northeast, east and southeast wards. There are a couple of um, smaller pockets in the south and southwest and one up in the northwest, but for the most part, they're all within the area called the NRSA. And this map will actually blow that up a little bit. And again, the tan area that you're looking at right in the center there is the NRSA. That NRSA is an area that is identified as part of our comprehensive plan each year by HUD, and it is an area that has at least 20% of the population is below um, poverty. So that's sort of an area that we're focusing on with this program, much like the RUCA <coughs> looked at that same NRSA area. A lot of the programs that we now operate through community and business development using CDBG funding are, in fact, um, HUD-funded programs and recognizes this, this um, area as our designated NRSA. But again, as we zoom in, you'll see that many of those areas are, again, in the north, north ward, northeast, east, and southeast, southeast areas of our city. This is the same map shows it a little bit differently. The darker the color, the higher the level of um, or number of unfit housing cases. So it's a, sort of a heat map that shows you have some ver very concentrated areas in some portions of the city of unfit housing. 
based upon the levels of unfit housing, what we try to do, and when I say we, I'm referring to staff from four different departments, planning, community assistance liaison, community and business development, city manager's office, work together to identify a blight factor. And the way we did the blight factor is fairly simplistic. The number of houses in a neighborhood divided by the number of uh, properties that have blight. So it's a fairly uh, easy computation that we did to determine a blight factor. Those blight factors range from about 6.5% of the units being unfit in some of the areas up to nearly a third of the properties being um, unfit in certain areas. So again, you'll see that we have those blight factors ranging from a lime green, I guess, all the way up to a very dark blue. And you'll see that, um, again, those same areas are popping up as being the areas that have the greatest levels of blight in the community. With those, um, and these colors are actually, I see them here as uh, purple and green, or purple and yellow on my screen, but I think that's actually supposed to be red and green, is what you're actually supposed to be looking at there. But those areas that are red had the highest level of blight. So they had an area that ranged from, I believe it's 13.8%, um, 86% of the units up to 30.8% of the units were unfit. Those, levels, those ones that are green are the lesser levels of blight. So what we did, uh, did then is set up two tiers, a red tier and a green tier. The green tier is tier two, red tier is tier one. We actually broke that down even more to identify those areas that we knew uh, as staff had active neighborhood associations. Some of them may have a neighborhood association but might not be active just because they're not active neighborhood associations didn't automatically disqualify them, but just one of the criteria that we thought you all might want to consider is having an active neighborhood association in those areas as a catalyst to help bring private or leverage private investment to bring to the table. Um, looking at the program itself, and this table is probably the table we should focus on as opposed to the table that's in the memo. That's the uh, few differences here. What we've actually done is consolidated some of the areas. So we actually started with 27 areas, I believe, and we now have consolidated that down to 24. Just because of the way that some of the neighborhoods geographically were located, it made sense to connect. Instead of having three wall towns, for example, we connect wall town and had one large wall town. But if you all feel that it makes more sense or some of the boundaries that we're using don't make as much sense as we currently have them lumped, we're open for suggestions there as to how we might be able to better identify some of the neighborhoods. Some of the neighborhoods are actually names that were on the planning maps from 1970s, but I'm not even certain if some of these neighborhoods even still exist in the names that they are now. I also had some duplications of neighborhoods. For example, I think there were two Northeast or two North Winston neighborhoods. I think there, might, uh, there was one east of Patterson and there was one west of Patterson. So a lot of these neighborhoods probably don't exist in the current state as they do now. So that's why you may have differences between the two tables. But for our purposes, there, we'll just focus on this table that's highlighted in the PowerPoint here. But taking this information, again, what we've done is we've identified, uh, I believe you have 11 areas here that are Tier 1 and 13 areas that are Tier 2 areas as part of the um, first, our first uh, attempt at presenting a program to you. Under the proposed guidelines, what we would recommend is that working with neighborhood associations, community development corporations, or other nonprofits such as Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods, for example, 
that we would invite these groups to work with city staff to submit proposals on how they might be able to leverage private resources and help bring additional dollars to the table. We would develop a scoring system for ranking these uh, proposals when they come in and try to assist those that have the greatest amount of leverage. That's going to be critical in this case because we're just taking a stab at numbers, but based on what we've seen in rehab in the last five-year period, the average cost is about $25,600 to do repairs. Assuming that is the case, then we had 100% participation again. Don't know what type of participation we would have, but you could conceivably talk conceivably be talking about a $31 million concept just on the residential properties. We've also done some initial public infrastructure assessments in those areas, and that's about another $27.5 million. So combined, we're talking about a 58 to $60 million concept with 100% participation. Don't know what it would look like. Um, more than likely, it would involve both homeowners and rental properties, uh, because a lot of times the rental properties are the problem properties in these areas. One of the factors that we did find that seemed to sort of jump out off the page was that the higher vacancy rates you had, had in the area, it didn't matter if it was home ownership, didn't matter if it was rental, but the vacancy rate was really the determining factor that really appeared to be one of those issues that led to the most number of unfit violations in some of these areas, the vacancy. So clearly we would think that we'd need to have landlords involved in this project or program as well if we were to go forward. We see it being a combination of amortizing loans, forgivable loans, grants. It could conceivably take the place of what we're currently doing now with our housing rehab programs and be operated under uh, Ms. Johnson through the Community and Business Development Program. So there's several things that we're still trying to address as part of this concept. I wanted to first talk to you all and sort of get direction and assuming uh, you all are satisfied with the approach at least, I think the next step would be that we want to go out and have community meetings. Make sure we're not missing anything because we've sort of created this in-house and staff and we really want to go out to the community and make sure is this something that you all feel would work and how would it work best to meet the needs of your neighborhood. So that's sort of where we are right now. Uh, I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Let, me, you may have. Sure, let me just make a question, an obvious comment. The entire council is, is sitting here right now, so I know this is going to be presented at some other committee meetings, but we, we certainly have it. We can certainly have everybody here right now, so if we run a few minutes over, I might suggest we continue going with it. With that, I'll just start with Okay, Ms. thank you. Um, first of all, I think we know from past experience that you almost have to have some sort of CDC neighborhood group, uh, a neighborhood organization, some central strong point for things like this to work. And, uh, you know, given that, I think we have to uh, get neighborhoods to organize some way to, to be able to uh, handle this. The other thing that we know from experience is that um, absentee landlords are usually completely unresponsive. My question, I suppose, is, is there any way to force some sort of, of compliance out of, of those, you know, landlords who live up in New York and just ignore what's going on here? Of course, the force of compliance right now is the minimum housing code. That's mm -hmm. the leverage that yeah. we have, and we keep bringing them through that process. Uh, some we see time, month after month after month, uh, some of the same owners. Maybe with a combination of a, a continuing aggressive code enforcement as well as a carrot to help them address some of their needs, we might be able to uh, partner or collaborate and work out of some of those issues of continuing to see the same properties over and over again. 
Thanks. Hope. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to come around, Ms. Montgomery. You're next. A couple of things. A <clears throat> um, couple of questions before I make a comment. In the numbers that we looked at here, was there any consideration or uh, in terms of if a certain percentage of homeowners took advantage of a program like this, what type of tax base increase would be potentially seen with that type of investment made in individual properties in terms of what return, immediate return, I know we'll see a return in terms of the neighborhood, but also with that amount of money being spent in some neighborhoods, what type of financial return could we potentially see back to the city based upon overall uh, tax base increase on investment in a neighborhood like that? I know you may not have a number for me on that, but... I have not, but that's actually a good strategy. We can take a look at that. Um, as well, um, when, when, as we've been looking at this, and this has been something that's particularly close to me, uh, one of the reasons I, uh, I ran for office in 2009 in particular is because of the issue that I saw and continue to see with substandard housing um, in certain parts of our city. And we do have certain programs that we have that I think do certain things. But I believe, uh, and I think many others believe, based upon what many organizations are doing right now, that we need to take a more targeted effort at looking at the areas and hot spots that are issues when it comes to housing. Uh, you see currently in our community that there are many individuals who make investments in our city who are taking this very same type of approach to how they make investments in, in, in community doing it more targeted rather than sporadically investing dollars with a house on this corner, a house t 10 miles away. And yes, for those families who live in those houses, it may be beneficial, but we have not seen a real transformation of a neighborhood and a community that's there. Um, one point that I would ask staff to look at um, would be, um, and you may have already looked at it, but the White House uh, Office of Urban Affairs um, has programs that started back in 2010, I believe, that they c describe as neighborhood revitalization initiative, which works to bring a collaborative effort within certain governmental departments to overlay what happens and does it in a targeted effort in a targeted way. And I think that's similarly what we're looking at in terms of how do we target the issue and do it where we're going to see real improvement. And I think in that, I know we're looking at residential, but for me, it, the, the word neighborhood needs to be included in this process because we're not just talking about just individual residential properties but we're talking about neighborhoods and that's why we say that you need to have a neighborhood association or a CDC because when you have neighborhood that means you have people invested and it's not just a person who owns a single individual property. Okay. Ms. Thank you. I think it's a great concept um, as to some of the pieces that were mentioned before. Uh, this is no different than what we attempted to do back in the 70s and the 80s in East Winston with uh, the first CDC and the establishment of Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods that came under the East Winston CDC with the Winston-Salem Foundation to tell or address the fact that you can't have a neighborhood if there's no organization and the people in the neighborhood aren't engaged and own that process. I believe that just as we said, the, uh, the organizations that have been listed or the agencies to assist with this process, um, I would just, I, I'm with it. Uh, I'd just like to see what their plan is coming forward to work together uh, to help make this happen and that the neighborhood actually is running it after being empowered. Uh, I think it's a great idea, a great concept, again, to think that we can have better neighborhoods, but you can't have them if you're working on something over here in, in East Winston, North Winston, Southeast. It needs to be a concerted pilot in each of these areas, and you've already uh, identified possibly the, the neighborhoods that could be the pilot. But uh, neighborhood organization is crucial. It's crucial. And uh, again, working with the city through Neighborhood Watch and any other thing that we can do to help make this happen. Crime goes down. Probably education goes up for the parents as well as the children, and it just makes a better place to live. Ms. Burke, I'm just going to go around. If you got any comments or questions? I agree with the uh, comments I've heard. Uh, I broke down how they assist, how the neighborhoods assist. That's important. And Councilman Montgomery and I, we've been talking about our areas overlapping, and if you try to take it all without a target area, you're not going to see the results. So it has to be a target area, and it has to be understood. Now, we have hired people to be your CALs, 
We've hired inspectors, and they need to be working together in these areas because sometimes it seems like we're spinning wheels. I hate to keep calling the mayor's name, but back there when we first looked in the 70s, mm -hmm. we saw such bad housing in East Winston mm -hmm. but, and, and also Northeast, and when I say East. And what we did, we targeted some areas. We went into that Reynolds town, really, and we put all those new houses that you saw, we tore down. But, uh, and that's the time when Mayor Corbin started mm -hmm. the East Winston uh, CDC. Mm -hmm. Because when you say neighborhood, it's not only the houses, it's the businesses too that we have mm -hmm. to look at because that makes the neighborhood. So what I would think uh, we could do, Mr. Chairman, one thing, we could go back and look at, at some things. We even called a lot of consultants in mm -hmm. here. Yeah. We've got reports to show where we have done all of this. Well, maybe we need to lift some of this off of paper. Mm -hmm. that, that's good and use it. Good point. Okay, I'm going to come back around this way. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, you had another There was um, one, other, one other question it was, and well, comment. And it just reminded me, um, I know we just recently closed in terms of accepting applications and things for uh, the dollars from, is it continuum care? Is that what that was for? Or the yeah. Friday, the seventh, and, and those dollars being spent in the NRSA, correct? They're being spent primarily in the NRSA, but there may be areas or organizations not, not within the NRSA that are receiving some of those dollars. And the reason I say, ask that question is because just not as, as we look at individual residential structures and neighborhoods, that when we look at agencies that we fund that are supposed to be providing services to the NRSA, are they actually providing services to these hotspot areas? Or are they actually providing services to the areas that need them and that are, 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 are really seeing some of the brunt? Or are they just blankly providing it? So I think these are, are real questions that, as you all are going through that process and reviewing these things, that some of the agencies need to be asked. Because you know I, we applaud great work being done by nonprofit organizations, but sometimes we, we do that stuff long enough that we kind of get a tunnel, but sometimes we need to step back and look at the picture from a broader perspective and say, are we actually hitting the areas that need it the most? in this big NRSA picture and even outside of that, are we actually hitting those things? So as we look at this program, it's also essential for us to look at the dollars we're investing outside of that. Are they actually hitting the right spots? And if not, how do we make those adjustments? Okay, Alan. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, following up on what Councilmember Montgomery said and Councilmember Burke, uh, I think it's vital we have a very active neighborhood association in these areas that that, that would give it a, a bump up, if you will. And then I think we ought to try to give extra points when, when a neighborhood can link with a RUCA, for instance, or link with a, a continuum of care program or with the police hotspots efforts or something like that. So, because I think the problem we've got, we've got all these people in these silos doing these programs. And I've been looking at poverty programs around the country, and we're doing most of everything that everybody's else is doing, but I think we're just not getting getting out of our silos and, and making the impact that we need. So uh, bust down those walls a little bit, and I think that will make this program even stronger. Molly? Okay. Uh, certainly, just to follow up uh, a little bit on what the mayor said, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the Homelessness Council, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there are, they they brought together all yeah, of exactly. those agencies and, and, you know, organized them. Organization is the, na the, the trick. I've got a name, by the way. Uh, Go ahead. Run. Are Revitalizing you? Urban Neighborhoods. Good. Runs. <laughs> Or run. It's been a long Monday. Uh, okay, Mr. McIntosh, I'm just going around the table. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to keep my comments short. This is an area that I've spent an awful lot of time in over the last 30 years yeah. working in, uh, in up and coming neighborhoods. And I think one thing we need to be careful about is this is a very complicated process mm -hmm. we're talking about. Um, I do agree, though, that it doesn't, it's not just doing houses, it's doing neighborhoods. That's been proven time and time again. And I think we have a good example here locally with our with, uh, Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. They've gone from doing houses to doing neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. That's and it really point. has, they, they've taken the, the leadership nationwide. Um, but I, I'm curious as to how we fit in with Habitat, how we, how we fit in with, with the Housing Authority. Um, are these, are we going to do these standalone or will we partner with them? I mean, I think those are questions that we need to, that we need to work on. 
um, and, and also the, the NRI, the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, I think those monies are gone, aren't they? Wouldn't that, and Dan Cornelius and the county were working with those? Not with those yeah, so, I mean, historic tax credits, there, there are lots of, lots of policies, but like the mayor says, you know, we're doing a lot of them. I think it's just integrating them. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we've got a smart group, and, you know, we put a different spin on it and just try to leverage what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dan, you're next. Yeah, yeah I, I might have some suggestions about identifying potential priority areas, but I need to ask a couple of questions about how you filtered what you've got here. Um, you know, looking at the... <coughs> At, at your first cut of, of priority areas, um, they all but two appear, appear to be completely contained within the shaded regions uh, of, of designated neighborhood or legislation strategy areas. Was that a filter that you used? No. The filter that we used, actually, um, Councilman Bessie was, you're talking about to go from level one to level two no, filter? No, to, to qualify for consideration on either. No, that, that was not a filter. We just sort of eyeballed where the largest concentrations were. There may be a concentration, for example, that, for example, if you look at the west side of Peters Creek Parkway, south of I-40. There's a concentration right there. It wasn't as dense as some of the other areas, so that sort of excluded it. But there may be areas that could be included, such as that. All right, so it, it sounds like there was not a precise filter used. That no, sir. Okay. Um, in, in drawing the lines of the areas, uh, did you restrict yourself to census tracts? did not restrict to census tracts, restricted to what neighborhoods have historically identified themselves as, as a neighborhood. So it may have crossed over census tracts, for example, but we did not use census okay. tracts as a d determining factor. Thanks for the clarification. We've got two comments. Okay. Uh, one is uh, for the areas that you have identified as potential priority areas in your first suite. Uh, I can only speak to the areas that I know most in detail, so th this is not going to be comprehensive. But for example, number 14, 14. <laughs> um, West Salem principally. Uh, if you look at your um, unfit housing violations density map um, uh, on page 91, it seems clear to me that the that the lines for area 14 are too narrowly drawn. And it, it, it excludes one of two areas that I can think of off the top of my head in my district. Um, I would think would be, you know, <laughs> appropriate potential target areas. If you look at, there are, there is a, a multi-block area um, within sort of the larger Ardmore neighborhood that is you know, part of that, um, uh, that page 91 density, you know, zone Got that's, you know, drawn out of the of 14 that I think uh, could benefit from being considered for the kind of assistance here. Yeah, this, this would be important. And second, you know, observation, and there, I'm sure there are other examples that I'd, I'd, I'd reconsider how the lines are the other factor, um, I'd consider whether uh, it would be useful to drop the size of, of the target area when you can identify a clear cluster within a smaller zone. And here the example I'm thinking of, you have to go back to 89 because it's not on the maps otherwise. Um, there is a, uh, a smaller area um, that is just south of the line of I-40 there. It's, you know, you test. That's, that's clearly a cluster. I know where that is. You know, that's the type of neighborhood um, that could clearly benefit from the attention being discussed, but you know, was not was not included on the on the first sweep of potential priority areas. I suspect because it didn't hit 
it wasn't within where you were where you were looking, frankly. Um, and also, it may have missed the the cut because it's not a huge area, um, but it's identifiable within you know, the the neighborhoods uh, around it as a a several street multi-block area in which a larger percentage of the household houses you know, need help. Um, so I I I do a resweep, you know, taking those two factors into account. James, I'm sorry I missed you when I went this way. No, I stopped it. Lee and didn't look one seat yeah. further. Go right ahead. Quite all right. I've been extremely patient. Um, I, I believe this has the potential to be a very, very good program. You, you, the whole the whole table knows how I feel about the RUCA program. Uh, being a, a young man that's born and raised in this community, I've seen in my lifetime the transition from really, really great neighborhoods to communities that have crime and substandard housing. I believe this is a great way to bring together uh, public and private dollars. Uh, in conjunction with what we're doing with the RUCA program, what we're doing with uh, the concept of police district offices. And I believe we have the ability to make a real good impact here. Now, I believe we have to be deliberate. Uh, I've taken into consideration every comment that's been made at the table. Uh, it's not something that we can rush into. I think this has the potential uh, to give some of our communities uh, on this map who needed the most uh, some help. And one of the things we're hearing, uh, Councilman Montgomery mentioned, you know, being elected in 2009. One of the things that I've always heard is we have to do a better job of improving communities east of 52. And that's not the focus here. Uh, but it, when the community says this is a problem, we've got to find solutions. So again, I think this is a wonderful program and it's something that I wholeheartedly support. Mr. Montgomery had another question. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry for, I just got a whole lot I want to say on this one. But um, one thing that just came to my mind as well in this process of, of thinking, I know we're going to have some conversation further down the road but for those of you all who attended last year the um, downtown partnerships um, annual meeting in which uh, they had a representative representative there from Oklahoma City and they talked about the investments that they made via bonds and the areas that they focused on in that bond in terms of how they made investments of dollars I just really think that if for those who weren't there just for a refresher I think it's some of that information that we can get just to redistribute um, out. I think what they did in that process, and I think Charlotte did, looked at a little bit of that and how they were looking at their uh, initiative as well using bond dollars, just looked at where are some of the areas of need and how do we help shift that. Because when you shift that focus and you make that investment, again, you tip that scale back up again. And it's, we oftentimes, again, look at the first investment, but as I asked for this one, what will be that return on, on the tax base? Because what they saw was an expansion of the tax base based upon the investments in, in some areas that were in need. So that's my last comment. Understood. I agree with Councilman Montgomery. When we, if we start talking about a bond referendum, Mr. Chairman, we, we have to do a good job of telling our story in the communities. Uh, you need votes in order to get a bond. And I think if certain communities uh, knew that they would see a return on their investment, they'd be more uh, likely to support that. Secondly, Mr. Page, are you still with me? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I did see uh, a neighborhood, at least one, so I'd ask that we go back and look at the neighborhood associations that are without active neighborhood associations on, on the right side of the chart here. Okay. I'm looking at, at uh, Forest Park, for example. That is a really extremely active neighborhood association. Maybe we've got to do a better job of getting them on the roads. But I know they meet regularly, and they're a powerful force in that community. So there may be others uh, who we wouldn't have to use neighbors for better neighborhoods. I think the more community development corporations and groups we can link into this, the better. Uh, but let's make sure we're grouping people where they need to be grouped. Just, just yep. real quick to Mr. Montgomery's point, there is uh, good empirical data uh, that comes out of Macon, Georgia, and some of their neighborhood re revitalization efforts and the return to, on investment in, in tax dollars. It's pretty powerful stuff. It's, uh, it's definitely something we should do. Okay. It's okay with you folks. I have tried to take good notes here, Lee. I'm going to kind of read off what we've come up with, and uh, then I've got a few closing comments. First off, I think probably everyone mentioned the need for strong neighborhood associations, that you cannot do this without them. Uh, second comment uh, had to do with absentee landlords and the, how do you work with an absentee landlord if they're out of state, out of mind, whatever. Uh, just mentioned the effect on the tax base. What Do we have any data there? Uh, concentrated effect was mentioned several times. Uh, next was, was, I wrote down federal help or federal programs or whatever it may be. We're talking counting the public infrastructure, $60 million, 
something there. Uh, Ms. Burke mentioned what do we do in the past. I think it's a good point, maybe study what worked, what didn't work. Uh, link programs, and initially that was linking them to, to the RUCA, maybe some of the police efforts, whatever. But then right after that, we mentioned Habitat and, and mm -hmm. Housing Authority. So I think it's the whole, how do you get out of those silos and combine all those people? Uh, what are the appropriate boundaries? Should they be bigger, smaller, or whatever? Uh, and then maybe some studies, some best practices mentioned where it's Oklahoma City and Macon, Georgia. So those were the comments that I wrote down. And I, I'll just conclude up with just a few simple comments. I, I think, Jeff, you probably said the most appropriate thing that is this is very complicated. Uh, it is. And, and if it was easy, everybody would do it. Uh, I certainly agree with the issue of neighborhood associations, but then I look at the chart here and can you have a neighborhood asso a strong neighborhood association if you have 50 to 60 percent of the homes being rented, rental, rental property? So I think, that, you know, how do you deal with that? I do think the issue of absentee landlords is imperative. Um, the concentrated effort, I, I think, is very important. I don't know if it does much good to fix up one house and leave two dilapidated ones on either side. I just think it'll it'll pull it down versus picking it up. But same time, we don't have that much money. If, if it's concentrated, then there's going to be one big winner or two big winners, and a lot of losers. And that that becomes uh, t tough around this table. On uh, you know, what's my vote worth to somebody, so to speak? Um, <laughs> Some of us are used to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I certainly like the idea of, of um, linking these with other programs. That's maybe a way to leverage our dollars. If Habitat's going into a neighborhood, maybe we go in with them, RUCA program, whatever. Uh, I think it's certainly too early to, to worry about or finalize the boundaries. We're going to have to do that as we go. But uh, I guess my closing comment, I, there's certain some areas, certainly a lot of areas that need it. Uh, but how do you come up with a program that, to me, has lasting impact? Uh, I do worry about giving some money to an absentee landlord to fix the screen door. Yeah. And because no one's living there and he lives in Oklahoma City or whatever, that the screen door gets damaged and it's just like it was a month later. So somehow it's got, I think, you got to have that lasting impact. And I think it's been mentioned by mm -hmm. several people. How do you, this concept, you got to be concentrated enough so you lift it up. And, and uh, if, if you got to, a, 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 rehabilitated house on either side, then maybe that one in the middle gets lifted up as, as somebody looks around and says, wait a minute, I can fix this up because the neighborhoods can, can support the tax base. So anyway. Um. That uh, goes along with my thought that the most important thing to accomplish something like that, like this, is allowing people to realize that they have the strength and power to accomplish this. Yes, we can help, but if, if you do it, if you are the moving force behind it, it's going mm -hmm. to last. Whereas if it's a throw money at something mm -hmm. without involving people, the, the people who live there, it's not going to last. Uh, yeah. All right, James. Just a really quick comment. In my opinion, if I were doing this thing, step one would be to organize some of these neighborhood associations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Step one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's clear direction to the staff, along with the council members and the cows. That's something we need to do firsthand. Ms. Burke. Uh, I know we talk about uh, neighbors for neighbors going to assist, but in my area, we've already started getting those neighborhoods organized. And when I look at the project We Care, where all these presidents from neighborhoods come in here, mm -hmm. they'll be some of the first ones we need mm -hmm. to be calling together where they live and see. And when I first say how they assist, as soon as they say the city is doing something, people start asking us for money. Mm -hmm. We have to show them you wouldn't have to partner with us. Mm -hmm. And I agree with something the chairman said. You have so many absentee landlords, and they complain a lot of them, but they're the ones who's tearing down these older neighborhoods, especially in East Winston. You go in the area like Boyne Park, Castle Heights. Now you're coming out the Carver School Road into the Ebony Hill, into the Monticello Park. We have a lot of absentee people coming in, and they're not interested. They're only in the investment. And like you say, they could be living in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Page, I hope these comments were helpful to you. Yes, sir. 
Let Mr. me shout. We'll be back, be back in a few months. Okay. Uh, let me remind the committee we did put off till next month the fund balance. If you have any questions, please get up with the folks. If I may take a point of personal privilege, there's a face that just walked in the room, and I just want to say I'm glad to see him yeah. back. Al, stand up. <laughs> have we got a lot of things for you to work yeah. on? So. <laughs> With that, uh, the Finance Committee will stand approved. It's 6 o'clock. If it's okay, we'll maybe break five minutes or so before general government. Well, well, public you. safety will start at oh, 6. Oh, oh, public yeah. safety. Public safety will start at 6.05. 6.05 for public safety. I kept referring to the wrong committee. <laughs>